how you handled the situation. Uh, very useful to people, I think. Uh, we'll be right back. We're talking with the heroic Will Grigg. You can watch the LRN Studio Cam and chat with other listeners anytime at cam.lrn.fm. That's cam.lrn.fm. It's all alive from baseball to apple pie to bomb. Waco, Texas, Heaven's Gate to Oklahoma bomb. The Desert Storm Syndrome experiment that went wrong. Inject our own because they probably won't come home anyway. The Vietnam conflict was a mere experiment. No. So just came back from the war. Couldn't all right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's anti war radio. I'm Scott Horton. I really appreciate y'all tuning into the show today. And and it's a good one. Margulies will be here. Josh Rubner will be here. I've never spoken with him before, but uh, he looks like a very interesting character. Other Scott Horton will be here. And right now we're talking with my buddy Will Grigg. He keeps the blog Pro Libertate at freedominourtime.blogspot.com. And I thought of ten different ways to start this segment back up again here, this interview back up again, but I think I just decided to uh, throw all those out and start with this instead. I'm just looking at my own Facebook page here, which is facebook.com slash anti-war radio, incidentally, and um, I'm looking at this lady. Uh, I didn't, I haven't even had a chance to really read the whole story, but all I know is here's a woman with a big frown on her face and two black eyes and a miscarriage, and she's suing the Indianapolis police, and then below that is your piece about the criminals with badges, that is the uh, militarized gang that terrorizes the people of Denver, Colorado, and I guess we could be talking about any town in America, I guess, what I'm learning, especially with the Facebook and the YouTube and the way things are now, oh, here's one a little bit further down, grandmother shot seven times by cops for refusing to answer the census. Um, and it goes on like this, and I just, you know, I don't know if it's the change in the technology, Will, or, you know, police brutality, not just for black folks anymore. Now it's for everybody right at the same time. Yeah. It's getting worse right at the same time that the technology is getting better, where, my God, man, it's like the cops kill at least one innocent person in America every single day, maybe more than that on average. You I'd, know? I'd be surprised if it were more than that on a daily average, but... I think you're dealing here with a combination of heightened visibility and a certain institu institutionalized impunity that didn't exist a generation ago. I do believe that the culture has changed, and it was programmed to change to the extent that government can actually bring about a change in the aggregate attitudes of the public. I think we've seen that because people do react in a certain way when they are incessantly barraged with all-encompassing propaganda about threats that can only be mitigated or dealt with through the intervention of government. People do make different calculations about their behavior and they perceive government policies differently if they believe that they're under some form of assault that only government can deal with, supposedly. And we've had a barrage of that, pretty much an incessant barrage of that for over a generation now in terms of the so-called war on crime and war on drugs. And the way that the rhetoric dealing with the police has been altered to reflect a military mindset, I think, has given birth, particularly when you're talking about that self-selected cohort of people to become members of law enforcement agencies, it, it has given birth to an attitude that these are soldiers in a domestic war facing a 360-degree battlefield, and when they're dealing with so much as a tremor of resistance or even non-cooperation on the part of a member of the public they're supposedly protecting, the instant reaction on many occasions, or at least the, the cultivated reaction, the reaction that they are trained to display, is to use some form of pain compliance that is often lethal, whether you're talking about taser, which is a lethal weapon. Let's not, let's not by any means wrap this in the gauze of euphemism. A taser is a lethal weapon. If you, pick, if you grab a taser from a police officer and shoot him with it, you'll be prosecuted for felonious assault with a deadly weapon. If you use a taser, if you're armed with a taser, and the rules of engagement of a local police department dictate that a firearm can be used to deal with deadly force, then a police officer, according to those standards, will be justified in shooting you and killing you if you threaten him with a taser. Now, if a police officer uses a taser against a citizen, or what I habitually refer to as a mere mundane, it suddenly becomes a less than lethal weapon. And usually when and if a citizen is killed as a result of that encounter, then a medical examiner will struggle valiantly to try to find some other contributing factor, such as heart disease, arteriosclerosis, high blood pressure, diabetes, 
some underlying medical condition. Often they'll talk about it being a result of excited delirium. The idea being that the police officer didn't kill that individual with a taser. The police officer used a taser, and the individual just happened to choose that moment to die. That's how they go about trying to sculpt the, the narrative, if you will, trying to finesse the narrative in order to preserve the idea that these are implements of, I guess, what, peace and public order in the hands of these anointed officers of uh, public coercion, whereas on the other hand, if we use them, they're considered to be lethal weapons. But they are lethal weapons. They're reliably, consistently lethal weapons. People are dying every day because they're being used for pain compliance, whereas 15, 20 years ago, we were told that they'd only be used in circumstances in which lethal force would be justified right. as, as an intermediate rung on the escalation ladder. Yeah. But they're the implement of first resort increasingly for police officers who are dealing with the momentary hesitation on the part of a civilian. Well, and it's all too civilian. predictable, too. I mean, and, and I think people, you know, probably don't even, a lot of people don't even really remember that. That, look, the cops, a lot of times they got no choice uh, because it, they're in a situation where they just can't win with their bare hands and they end up having to pull their gun and shoot somebody. So now we'll give them this less than lethal gun, basically, so that mm -hmm. if they're in the position where they would have to shoot, maybe now they can shoot but not to kill with this taser instead. And I guess, you know, there will be heart, people with heart problems who die of their heart problems while they happen to be getting tased. But still, that's better than getting bullets straight through you. At least you got a better chance than that. And yet, like you say, they don't reach for their – when when it's a, a time when they would reach for their gun, they reach for their gun. When yeah. it's a time for them to reach for their taser, uh, you know, they've already used it ten times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, yeah. they use that instead of a headlock, instead of a – you know, grab, try to grab somebody by the wrist or anything. Or, it's their first resort. Yeah, or instead of de-escalating the situation. Yeah, exactly. That's a completely lost art now. When I was growing up in a small town in Oregon and later in a different small town in Idaho, I spent a lot of time in the company of police officers where they're talking about uh, street officers, just commonplace, everyday uh, beat cops, or I spent a lot of time doing ride-alongs as a teenager with the deputy sheriff I knew in the little town of southeastern Idaho where I grew up. And I had long conversations about subjects of this sort, and usually the police officers I knew at the time made it a point of pride to tell me that they had never actually drawn their weapons and that they were trained to try to find ways of diffusing a situation in such a way that everybody would go home, that you'd be able to resolve a situation without taking somebody to jail, without, of course, shooting somebody or otherwise brutalizing somebody. But that's changed. That is something that I think is a definable change in law enforcement just during the last generation or so, largely as a result of this insane policy called the War on Drugs, which is a very literal shooting war taking place within the borders of our country that is claiming lives every single day and resulting in deeply entrenched corruption and, thus as importantly, creating an outright, undisguised military, law, uh, military mindset on the part of law enforcement. Now, rather than dealing with people as, as people, that is to say as individuals who may or may not pose an actual threat to the property and persons of others, now the idea is that you must make them submit. You must command your battle zone. That's the military approach. That's a martial law assumption, the idea that you simply have to obey anything that dribbles down the chin of a tax-fed functionary is part of a martial law mindset. You have to submit, and in the grand, the grand scheme of things, the hierarchy of society, because you're not dressed the way they are and you're not paid by the public fisc to go out and compel people, you are below them. You are subordinate to them, and you have to recognize that at a time of their choosing. And that's a very ominous change in the culture that has happened within the last generation and is not getting any better. God help us when the people come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly in Afghanistan where a lot of these people are going to become drug addicts because they're protecting the government to run opium uh, supplies over there. But they come back to this country and they can't find honest work. They're going to go into law enforcement. They're going to, in that field, employ everything they learned in these all-encompassing battle zones. And things are going to get measurably worse if we ever see an actual de-escalation and demobilization from these wars overseas. So we really got a, a mess on our hands that's going to last for a generation or longer because it's taken us a generation to get into this mess. Yeah, well, this is the part of the show where I get to fix blame. It's the American <laughs> people's fault, Will, because you know what happened? is The the cops saw the reaction to the Waco massacre, yeah. which was, yeah, kill them! Exactly. And they said, wow, this is great. We can do this from now on. And then 
you know, they use the exact same, uh, you know, pattern of demonization and ac- the very same accusations against Koresh. They turn around and use the exact same model against Saddam Hussein. He's crazy, yeah. so we can't deal with him. He's bad to his own people, and he's got illegal weapons, and we're going to send in the Delta Force to torture and burn them to death. And, and now they're doing the exact same script against Iran, too, and the people love it. Show us an enemy, tell us why they're a demon and they ain't human, and it's okay to kill them, and then we will sit, we, the American people in their vast majority, will sit cramming their mouth full of popcorn and watching the fire on TV and loving it. It's yeah. better than a football game. Sure, drinking their Brondo and yeah. otherwise behaving like beautiful you like money? Of idiocracy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right, everybody, that's Will Grigg. He uh, keeps the blog Pro Libertate at freedominourtime.blogspot.com. Thanks so much, man. Take care, Scott. We'll be right back, y'all.